Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. I have been here at the Cancer Support Community for over 16 years, and I'm a facilitator for exercise classes, the nature walk, um, stress management workshops, as well as education workshop like this. So I'm happy to be here to share this topic with you today. We're going to be going over the difference between regular fatigue versus chronic fatigue and cancer fatigue. And I will be talking about research and what current research shows is the best way to manage fatigue in not just the medical community, but in rehabilitation as well. And my background is occupational therapy. And so I've worked for 35 years in occupational therapy in different settings. So I'll bring some of that into the presentation with a lot more detail about how we can manage our defaults. So we'll get started with our first slide. And I'm just going to go over the cancer related fatigue. It's um, a decreased capacity for our activity that's often accompanied by the so sleepiness, irritability, weariness. It's the most common uh, side effect of cancer and cancer treatment. We often feel that we're overwhelmed, maybe listless, weak, or drained. And usually fatigue, normal fatigue, when we, we don't have cancer, cancer treatment, when we sleep, it'll we'll feel rested and we'll, we'll feel better. But with this type of um, fatigue, it sometimes linger. So not all patients have lingering effects, but sometimes the uh, cancer-related fatigue can last for several months, up to a year. Generally, within a year, the symptoms subside and one feels better. Other times, it can, can go on a little bit longer. So there's different things that can contribute to this. And some of the causes um, are the treatment itself, like I mentioned. So chemotherapy, the fatigue levels are different, where you feel it right after your treatment, you might feel a little more energy, and then the next treatment, you feel it goes down again. So it's kind of up and down, where the fatigue with radiation can be more progressive and get a little bit more as time goes through the treatment. Hormonal and biological therapies can also contribute to chronic, uh, to cancer-related fatigue, and um, other factors can play into fatigue uh, with people that have had cancer. And so those are what I'm going to highlight next. Um, so other things that can contribute to fatigue that sometimes get blurred in there is anemia, pain, emotional distress, um, can be a one, a lot of the depression symptoms coexist um, when we have a major illness, whether it be cancer or something different. And so there's overlap of symptoms between a different diagnosis, like depression, uh, with cancer. So different other, other host factors, these are things that can contribute. Medication, side effects, um, trouble sleeping, sleeplessness, our nutrition, maybe not getting good exercise, and alcohol and drug use and can make us fatigued and can contribute to it. And digestive issues and other things like not drinking enough water. I talk about that a lot. Those of you that take my exercise classes know that I really remind a lot um, hydration and how important that is to help in giving us more energy. If we're dehydrated, that we can definitely show uh, diminished hydration in, in our energy levels. So insomnia and trouble sleeping, we have a lot of uh, programs here and education workshops that will help with sleep. Sleep is a big one, can contribute to fatigue. So when I was doing the research about um, how we can manage fatigue came up with this one was good. It was a um, meta-analysis in 
they're looking at 113 different studies. We had over 11 and a half thousand people. And they're looking at whether medication, pharmaceutical, alone or exercise, psychological, what types of treatments were the best in exercise. Um, that's number one for helping to reduce the uh, fatigue and combination of exercise with the psychological interventions was recommended. It's, it's recommended based on all of those studies to be the uh, most recommended treatment. So that's, that was a good one that I found. So here's some more research that I found on treatment. Um, so use yoga, acupuncture, different uh, techniques like that with the, the complementary medicine. And the exercise here again was the, the number one concept that was supposed to be helpful, but the best treatment for non-pharmacological intervention. So the psychosocial interventions and energy conservation measures. So when I say energy conservation, a lot of times people think, oh, that's like insulating my attic. Well, yes, that's true for our home. But for, for this, we're actually conserving the, our energy reserves within ourselves. So that's the main um, technique and strategy that can help uh, conquer fatigue. Uh, is energy conservation principles. And that's what I'm going to really focus my talk on today because that's what I specialize in as an occupational therapist and I work with patients. So we're going to really talk about that mostly today and get really specific on what that is and what it can do to help us. As to, so we can get into our energy reserves and to create energy reserves so that we have them and we'll not be less fatigued. And of course, sleep. Is another big one, like I mentioned. And this was an, a study review here from 1990 to 2019 in acupuncture pressure and mindfulness based cognitive therapy, Tai Chi, Qigong, all of these things helpful in the integrative therapy sections. And then, like I mentioned before, the CIM, the complementary, the integrated medicine, a lot of more living cancer centers incorporate these into the routine care. And so that, that those multiple approaches are really good to um, address fatigue, including nutrition, uh, supplements, stress reduction. And the circadian rhythm management, in case you're not sure what that is, that is basically getting your heart rhythm and your sleep-weight cycles. That's kind of more in the line of sleep management sleep wake cycles regulated that won't really help make a huge difference. So those are some things that have shown to be effective as well. And energy conservation, like I mentioned, is I'll go into a lot more detail here in the next several slides talking about how energy conservation principles, when we adapt them to our life, can really help us um, to have a better quality of life. So it refers to uh, basically doing activities so that we have less strain into our body or joints. We have to minimize our fatigue. And we're using our body in a, in a more efficient way, like using proper body mechanics and having better posture. We're avoiding, it's, it's a, using our body in a way that we're avoiding being overtired. And we're conserving our energy so that we have a balance between the things that we have to get done and the things that we'd like to do. Work, responsibilities around the house, balancing that with our leisure so we have enough energy reserves to function well. And the next um, concept is work simplification. And that kind of defines itself. Work simplification is just basically working in the easiest way possible. So you're not as frustrated um, and you're, you're using your energy reserves so that you can it last throughout the day. So it's basically common sense, like how can you make things easier? So. Who benefits? 
everybody. I use them and I am healthy. I don't have any conditions, but especially if you, anybody that has respiratory problems, either um, like a, a cold or acute, you know, short-term respiratory problem or long-term, if you have any pain or fatigue or limited mobility, weakness, generalized weakness, uh, when, when we've been hospitalized or if we have any other conditions like a heart condition, respiratory, of course, chemotherapy, radiation, um, all of these uh, will help the benefit. But everybody, just um, we've had cancer, cancer treatment. So the benefits of conserving our energy is basically we, we need to develop new habits and we're learning um, new ways to do things that we've always done. So maybe you've always worked real fast and you like to uh, do things quickly and that's your way of doing it. But we're, we're thinking in new ways and how to uh, accomplish the same task, but in a uh, more energy conserving way. So we're conserving by reducing our fatigue and shortness of breath, and it reduces the strain on our body, on our joints, our heart, and we can have more sustainable energy. It promotes more independence too, and improves our quality of life by adjusting to the daily routines. So the quality of life is, this is the main goal. This is our primary goal of what we want to achieve, improving our vitality and our wellness. So next several slides, I'm going to talk about energy conservation principles. And this is applying to our everyday living. Home tasks, work tasks, our everyday hobbies, rest and sleep and wet rest cycles. And we use six P's to kind of help to remember. And they are prioritizing, planning, positioning and posture, pace, positive attitude, and breathing. Good breathing. So right, I'll go over each individual one. And then we'll, we'll talk about each level. So our goal, we're prioritizing. We're thinking about all the things that we need to get done in the day and all the specific tasks that we need to complete. And we're prioritizing which one's the most important. For example, let's say like the doctor's appointment is more important. Then let's say going out to get um, your haircut or something like that. So it's like you have you also prioritize in your day what requires the most energy. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the next one, which is planning too. But you're trying to like uh, give a hierarchy of what needs to get done first. And once you do that, then you're going to plan. You're breaking down your the task into stages and maybe to eliminate some things that might not be necessary. So when you plan ahead, you're gathering all the supplies you need for an activity and that uh, reduces the amount of walking back and forth to collect things. So when you're planning, you're more organized and that will help save your energy. And we're alternating light tasks with heavy. So like with prioritizing and planning, like if you have several things to do in the course of the day, you want to make sure that the day, the part of the day that you have the most energy is the heavier tasks, and the part of the day that you may be feeling sloppy, like after lunch or in the evening, you might want to do lighter tasks. And a lot of this is kind of um, common sense and self-explanatory, but you know, sometimes we have to change our habits. Um, we don't like rush to get everything done all at once. Quickly, that takes up more energy and then we, uh, we sometimes run out of energy. So we want to plan our activities also throughout not just our day, but throughout the week. So if we have several things to get done in one week, we want to spread them out versus trying to create them all in one or two days. And that will really help to prevent fatigue. 
And of course, big one is the last thing is asking for help to plan ahead and maybe ask for assistance sometimes when you need that. And that's hard to do for those of us that are very by nature. Uh, but I'm going to get to more detail in that in a bit. So, positioning. So posture. So if I'm slumped in my chair, I do this in my classes. Those of you that come to my classes, you know I do this. Then I'm not breathing well. I can hardly breathe. And I'm feeling tired. And sitting too much and sitting in a poor posture, that can affect your balance. Sitting or sitting. So sitting up straight. A good, correct posture, it opens up space for us to breathe more. And um, so that gets more clear to get more oxygen as we're breathing, sitting up straight, and that helps us with our energy reserves. So the, the don't and the body mechanics positioning and, and our body um, posture can be affected like when you're doing activities, we want to limit bending over because that can cause more energy. It's a lot harder, and it's also worse for your back. Twisting and reaching really far can also cause fatigue if you're going back and forth like this. You want to keep your workspace uh, where everything's easy to reach, close to hand, and so that can reduce your fatigue. And stooping, you know, we want to avoid stooping. So, Using proper body mechanics in therapy, we don't always just talk about this. We actually practice it. So we're practicing good posture and we're practicing proper lifting techniques. So we lift un improperly, we can create more fatigue than if we're our feet apart, staggering our feet, bend the knees, lift with your legs versus your back, keeping the, the object you're lifting close to your body versus away from your body. All of these are positioning and strategies that help to, to reduce the strain on your body and help you complete tasks, physical tasks that are easy, that have to make it easier. And then pace, pacing is the next beat. Pace is important to rest. Now, rest is challenging. You don't want to rest too much because if we stay in the chair like this, man, relaxing too long, then that will contribute to it. So staying in one place too long is not good. You want to rest. It's important to incorporate rest as you pace yourself. Like I mentioned earlier, we're planning, we're prioritizing, pacing and spreading things out, not cramming it into a short amount of time or speeding through. So allowing extra time to do activities without rushing. And or resting before we get tired. That's an important strategy. We don't push, 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 and then, then rest when we're exhausted. We, just before you're feeling like you're starting to get tired, that was a good time to take five or six minutes, it's five or 10 minutes to relax. But we're not staying there all day, right? Because that can contribute to fatigue when we, do, when we don't do enough, too sedentary. So, or um, here again, ask help if you need it. We're honoring our body. We're listening to our body. And if we're feeling like we're pushing it too far, we hit step back. And now positive attitudes. Our attitude is, or this one is, a lot of times we think about all the things that we can't do, especially if we struggle with fatigue. We think, oh, I just wish I could do that, but I just can't. And we kind of go over it and go loop in our brain over and over again. Wow, I'm just too tired. Kind of talk ourselves into it and we don't get things done. So this is a, a, new, a new thing to think about. Um, you can, I talk about this in my other workshops. Is sometimes when we write things down, it can help us to be more aware. So if we're writing down what we are getting accomplished, those would be that like lists and check off lists. If you write down what you are accomplishing, sometimes that can reframe things so that your attitude shifts, so that you're thinking more about what you can do and what you have accomplished. Then over the end of the week, you can see, okay, well, maybe I do have fatigue, but look how much I need that they actually get done. So you're looking more on the brighter side of what you can do 
and maybe jot it down to remind yourself. What I do is I use my phone. And I have a calendar that I use on my phone, and I list what I have to do for the day. And sometimes I'll add things in. It just makes me feel better. <laughs> so, like, if I get, oh, well, I went to the bank, too, and I have this and I have that. And then I look at it, I'm like, okay, well, I did get a lot done today. For me, that I'm a list person, so that helps me kind of shift my attitude a little bit. Okay, I'm going to take day. It was pretty productive, more than I realized. Um, so that's um, one thing to kind of think about. It can help you to respect your limits, your capabilities, balance them, uh, so that you can work on progressing towards your goal. So the breathing, um, I wanted to talk about the vagus nerve because there's a lot of, you might have heard about the vagus nerve. It's a long nerve that travels from our body from the ears all the way down through the whole body. It, it helps the function of a lot of, of uh, organs and it also helps us with becoming more relaxed and help us sleep better. It lowers our anxiety. Um, and it's very important for helping our energy reserves. Because if we are anxious, depressed, having trouble sleeping, keeps us awake at night. This is a big contributing factor. So the breathing is important uh, for that, to help us to lower down the stress response, our cortisol that can make the heart race and mind go a little bit too fast. So the breathing is, is really good. We're stimulating our vagus nerve, increasing the vagal tone by breathing well and slow. And I do this a lot. Uh, personally, and it helps me when I'm really tired in between classes that I teach and driving between different places where I work, uh, just in the parking lot oftentimes. If I'm feeling fatigued, I'll just inhale for two seconds. You can do it with me. And then, and then exhale through your mouth like you're blowing on a candle for four seconds. So breathing in a little bit faster, two seconds. And then exhale long. So you stretch out your exhale. And as you stretch out that exhale, it slows our nervous system down and it increases our vagal tone. It's very simple. You can actually hum when you do that. Singing is also another good thing to do for that. But the breathing is easiest. Inhaling slowly, exhaling longer. Just doing that a few times will really help. We practice that in a lot of the classes we teach here. It's a real easy strategy that will help build our energy reserves. We can follow on. And then be surprised, you feel a little more alert because the oxygen is flowing to your muscles, your cells, your brain, and it makes you more alert, as does um, hydrating, drinking water, trying to do that. When we're dehydrated, our brain doesn't function well. When we're hydrated, we can think clearer. So this is a slide I referred to earlier with delegation. And this is really challenging for a lot of folks. I noticed the, some of my patients, especially, you know, it's like we are ill, even if it's temporary or if it turns out to be a longer term. It's, um, it's really challenging to give up a lot of um, our roles and our tasks that we like to do. So delegating some of the things that are harder or more challenging is, is an important thing. Um, it's hard to give up too much. We don't want to give up too much, but the ones that are really important to us, we want to try to hold on to. And then if you're able, you can either ask a family member or a friend that might offer, how can I support you during this time? If they say that, then it's good to maybe have a list handy. Make yourself a list of specific tasks or things, instructions of things that you might really need help with. A good example I'll talk about later more is, for example, like when we're running errands, like is grocery shopping. Because sometimes if we're in, a, in treatment, we have a low, low point, really struggling. Grocery shopping is something that takes a lot of energy. It takes more energy than you realize when you get out there to do it. Um, and that's something that is easily can be done by someone else or maybe a service. Yeah, service. 
pick up now. Like during the pandemic, we've got a lot of people were able to pick up from the parking lot and put the services that can help with that. Be able to, uh, to get that. Delegating responsibilities, um, it's, it's challenging, especially people that are independent. But um, it's really important if, if you need to at certain times, we take levels of time to, to be able to do that and, and also to communicate, to be assertive, uh, not just assume people know that you know, you know being uh, assertive and communicating that your fatigue levels are really high and then that can be how people can support you. You, know, you, can, you can talk about that to them, to your employer if you're working with or your family members. Uh, it's, it's another way to manage the leverage. So next part of our presentation is going to get more specific into conserving our activities daily living. So this is the day the activities we do every day. So eating, surprisingly, eating can sometimes be um, take some energy. Dressing, bathing, hygiene, shopping, housework, gardening, yard work, recreation, all of these topics we're going to do. So I mentioned hydration and swallowing can sometimes be a problem. So we can affect our taste. But if we don't eat well, we don't have proper nutrition, that can make us feel, that was one of those factors I mentioned earlier that contribute to fatigue. So making sure we're, we're having, uh, consuming fluids and if you have another condition that restricts your fluid intake, of course you have to follow that. But making sure blood sugar so level, levels are, uh, are good. I know a lot of, there's a lot of nutrition seminars that go into a lot of detail about how we can sustain our energy with our nutrition. So I'm just touching on it here, but there's a lot of videos that can support community has on their website and um, maybe YouTube that will talk more about that in detail. But digestion, when we're digesting our food, that's extra spending energy to do that. So taking some time to rest after you eat is a good idea just to uh, let everything digest before jumping into the next thing. So that's some strategy there. So some more strategies to um, help with dressing is if you're having trouble getting dressed, you can sit whenever you need to. I use this too. When I get dressed in the morning, I have a chair in my closet and uh, I'm really tired at the end of the day, or I want to put my shoes on, sit to do that. Um, organizing your clothes the night before, if you're getting up early in the morning is another strategy. If you're not a morning person, you get really fatigued in the morning, then if you have it pre planned and everything's ready to go, I usually pack my car up the next day, the night before, because I'm a night person. So my energy levels are higher at night. So I might do that with that. You can do that with your clothes. And um, avoiding the bending and reaching we talked about earlier. And you can always prop your foot up as you're putting on a shoe. I, this picture here is um, using a reacher and a long game with shoe horn to help um, a sock aid to put your shoes and socks on. This is a lot more detailed and when you're in inpatient kind of situation. Um, but Velcro is easier, or, and using shoes with Velcro and clasps easier, and button front shirts are easier than pull on. Those are just some strategies. So, bathing, uh, long handle butts, brush there, we have uh, the shower with breath bars you can use, um, tub bench, all kinds of adaptive equipment. Taking breaks and resting in between is a good idea. And um, another strategy that's really good is using a terry cloth robe to dry off. So if you have a robe, you can put that on instead of drying off. And that, that's an easier, quicker way to dry off without having to use a lot of extra energy. And we can sit to put on our makeup or to shave also using an electric razor season. So this is a therapy um, clinic where the occupational therapist is demonstrating how to use long handle devices like a bath sponge, just to, so you're not bending over as much, and that's a way to save energy. The um, 
raised toilet courses, which is you'll get up and down, reacher, and all the other adaptive equipment that I mentioned. So shopping and errands. So this is far as quite a bit, actually, especially um, people that shop a long time. So if you're like, going out and you're from store to store, that can be very fatiguing. So, so these strategies are helpful to um, prevent fatigue by preparing your list ahead of time of what you want to get. And I remember when I was growing up, my mom used to do this, and I never understood why. She had six kids, two sets of twins, and it was very challenging for her. She had a very limited amount of time and limited time, amount of energy. She was tired most of the time, as you can imagine. And uh, so anyway, she would organize her list where she would have all of the degree one section. All, and she had her store memorized. She knew from the time she got in the door <laughs> where, where she was going to be going. And so you can organize according to your aisle. So you're not like running around the store all over the place looking for things. So I know that's, you know, it's kind of detailed, but it's, it's one way to, you know, which store you're going to, to uh, save some steps so you're not in end time as well. Of course, using um, shopping carts instead of baskets that to lean into uh, as you're shopping. And lifting, lifting, especially heavy items like the detergent, things like that are heavy. Pushing is better than pulling, and sliding is better than lifting. So, energy conservation principles if you have a, a choice to lift something, if you need to move something heavy, pushing is better than pulling it. This requires more energy and causes more fatigue to pull something it does to push it. It's also easier to slide things rather than lift them. And using wheels are really helpful, like the dollars. So shopping at uh, less busy times is another strategy because we don't realize when we shop during busy times that uh, we have to wait in line longer. And then that's very fatiguing, just standing. Some people are more fatigued standing than they are moving. I hear that a lot. And so um, shopping at quieter times, you can get in and out quicker and you don't have to stand around, which can really make you fatigued. And of course, now there's a lot more curbside pickup into this that we talked about earlier. So in housework, dividing, we go delegating some, balancing light and heavy. Um, you know, some of us might tend to want to get it all done in one day because that's the way we always did it. And that's those old habits that I talked about earlier. And um, planning and prioritizing, spreading things out over the course of the day or week, depending on how much you have to get done, is a very, very good idea. And also sitting to prepare, you know, to, to fold is a good idea. And one strategy that I share that gets the most, most people really appreciate is the changing bed lengths. So this strategy is where when you're changing your, your sheets, especially if it's a king size bed, it's really a lot of walking around and around and around, getting fitted sheet, your top sheet, blanket in your comforter. So it's a lot of walking. So to avoid that, you fluff out your bottom sheet, your fitted sheet, then right on top without, you know, you know, put the corners on. The next layer, put the next layer on top, then the next layer. You only walk around the bed one time. You work on one corner, we do all three, straighten all things, uh, strip three things on one corner, to the next corner. So that you're only going around the bed one time instead of several. So um, a lot of people like that strategy when changing sheets. It's just a very specific, but it's a different way to think about doing things to make things. That's a work simplification strategy. And um, so asking for help with the YouTube and allowing the dishes to dry on their own versus drying them, or maybe you know, dishwasher into that. So um, making the weekly plan, plan for major drops like laundry, cleaning, 
doing one large job a day is a great strategy versus trying to, to develop a bunch of all of day. Spread it out. And um, keeping cleaning supplies in each room is another idea. Some people live in two levels. You have upstairs, downstairs. Consider keeping well, cleaning supplies, including the vacuum, so you're not lifting a heavy vacuum up and down the stairs on each level of the house, so that you're not wandering around trying to find your cleaning supplies. It's a lot more steps that way. Um, I have a long handle dustpan that I use. It's very helpful. You just, you know, for everyday cleaning, and you don't have to bend over. And it's really helped to reduce um, strain. Cooking, same as a lot of the other strategies talked about. Um, making large meals and freezing them for later use is a good plan. Um, keeping everything within easy reach versus having to reach too much. Uh, like if you keep a certain pot that you use every day, have it in, in one of the closest levels, like maybe even on the Keep it on your couch. And like we mentioned, if you have like a heavy pot of water, you're sliding it on a towel versus lifting it. And that's a strategy that will really help. Um, if you're standing for long periods of time to uh, chop or wash dishes or anything, it's uh, good to you have a cabinet underneath, open your cabinet and put one foot up. And that reduces the strain on the wall back. These are all strategies to use your body mechanics in ways to eliminate strain on the body. Of course, you could use paper plates instead. I've never done that, but some people do. And that's a way to avoid having to wash the dishes, um, to eliminating dishwashing. So this is another slide I put in, just about open hands and meals on wheels. Consider that. If, um, it's better we eliminate split tasks altogether. Those of you that are a gardener, I am, especially this time of year, it's everything's in the home, it's beautiful. We want to um, arrange our sequence. We want to work out about shoulder, a little bit lower than elbow height right here when you're gardening. Uh, if you can bring things up to the level, we're working on potted plants, working up this level uh, is, is good. Limit bending, twisting, and reaching. I know that's hard to do, but bend your knees uh, when you're reaching down to avoid bending at the hip. That's very bad for your back. And it also is very fatiguing, um, causing pain, and you don't sleep well, and then it's a vicious set. So for gardening, just um, use a kneeler if you're able to kneel. Um, push, don't pull, and slide, don't lift. Same thing. And uh, asking for help, maybe considering the higher heavy tasks like the lifting and going to just help you, or use a wheeled cart, of course, instead. Much better than trying to lift this. So, hobbies are next. Hobbies, depending on what you do, you want to sit if you need to, gather your supplies, ask your friend to enjoy it. So for exercise, I want to go into exercise. Moderate levels of exercise and walking, exercising regularly can decrease our fatigue and helps with sleeping. If we exercise too much, it can actually lead to more fatigue, of course, we overdo. Um, but we don't want, and we can rest in between. We don't want to rest too long when we're resting. As if you take a nap later in the day, like 30 minutes, that longer than 30 minutes can interfere with your sleep. So you want to rest, but not too much. You can take a nap, but not too long. Um, and the exercise, of course, we want to aim to try to get 30 minutes, um, most days of the week, but work up gradually. When you're in treatment and you're not able to exercise at all, that's not doable. Just do a little bit at a time. Just try not to give in to the big blanket chair. So we offer a lot of classes here at the support community in grading the exercise gradually, um, working up to build up your stamina gradually. And then those of you with grandkids, kids or grandkids, um, having the children come up to you versus you going down to them is usually easier. And maybe make a game out of household chores, um, include them in, 
um, or do some activities more over there at the table. So just some different ideas of how to uh, conserve their energy. Kids, it's so our gold standard. Like I mentioned earlier, all the evidence does point to exercise really being excellent for health. Our key takeaways: we prioritize, we plan, we pace, good posture, and use assistive devices if we need them, and ask for help when we need them. Planning rest times in, taking breaks, 10 minute breaks, like we mentioned, we don't rush. Rushing um, can make things three times as hard. And we use 25% less energy when we sit to perform a task than when we stay. So my presentation, remember that the most important energy conservation tip is to listen to your body, honor your body. And we have habits, we want to be flexible and stop and rest before you get tired or look overdue. Don't push to the extreme and then regret it later. These are my references. And I'm open to take some questions. I'm going to check the chat here. Paper plates for pizza only, Patty. <laughs> How about naps? Okay, I mentioned naps. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.